In the shadows of the unknown, where nightmares thrive and fear takes root, three tales of terror await you, each more haunting than the last. First, witness the horrifying downfall of a rebellious girl, whose defiance during the ghost month awakens something far more sinister than superstition, a possession so terrifying it will chill your very soul. Then, spend your final night at Blackwood Manor, where secrets of the past refuse to rest. What will you uncover when darkness falls and the manor reveals its true nature? And finally, step into the haunting corridors of a cursed Airbnb. This isn't just a story, it's a terrifying true account that will make you think twice before your next stay. Three stories, one nightmarish journey. Do you dare to face what lies on the other side? In Southeast Asia, during the Ghost Festival, the seventh month of the lunar year, the gates of hell open, allowing spirits to roam the earth. Families burn offerings and leave food by the roadside for deceased loved ones and lost souls. This story follows Kelly, a rebellious teenager who disregards her mother's warnings about the festival. Kelly's mother had always been adamant about the traditions of the Ghost Festival. Never kick the offerings on the roadside, Kelly. It will offend the spirits, she warned. But Kelly, a headstrong teenager, always did the opposite of what her parents told her. She found the stories of spirits and ghosts nothing more than superstitions. One evening, after an outing with her friends, Kelly returned home after sunset. The streets were dimly lit, with flickering lights casting eerie shadows. As she walked home, she saw several offerings by the roadside. Incense, food, and paper money burning in small, controlled fires. Her mother's warning echoed in her mind, but Kelly felt a rebellious urge rising within her. Agitated by her mother's constant nagging about old legends, Kelly kicked one of the offerings. A sudden gust of wind blew past her, sending shivers down her spine. She looked around, but nothing happened. She laughed it off, <laughs> thinking her mother was just old-fashioned and gullible. When Kelly got home, she went straight to the bathroom. As she was about to wash her face, she felt an uneasy sensation, as if someone was watching her. She turned around but saw no one. Shrugging it off, she splashed water on her face. As she looked up, a terrifying ghost appeared right behind her in the mirror. Kelly gasped and spun around, but the ghost had vanished. Her heart pounded, but she convinced herself it was just her imagination. She decided to take a shower, hoping it would calm her nerves. As she washed her hair, she felt something, or someone, stroking her. She froze in terror, but when she opened her eyes and looked around, she saw nothing but the steam-filled bathroom. Finally, Kelly went to bed, hoping to forget the unsettling events. But her sleep was far from peaceful. She dreamt she was trapped in a realm of lost souls, their skeletal hands reaching out to devour her. She could feel herself aging rapidly, turning into a skeleton. The horror of the dream jolted her awake, leaving her panting and drenched in sweat. The room was silent, illuminated only by the dim moonlight filtering through the window. Kelly noticed a shadowy figure in the dark corner of her room. As she focused her eyes, the figure seemed to take shape, slowly emerging from the darkness. With a sudden whoosh, the ghost's face appeared right in front of her. Kelly screamed, and everything went black. When she opened her eyes again, she was in her living room, surrounded by her concerned parents and a priest. Her parents told her they had found her in front of the fridge, ravenously eating raw meat as if she hadn't eaten in days. They tried to pull her away, but she was filled with an unnatural strength and resisted violently. It took the help of neighbors to subdue her and tie her to the bed. For three days, Kelly remained in this possessed state, screaming that she was hungry and exhibiting behavior that was far from normal. Desperate, her parents had called the priest to perform an exorcism. As the exorcism ended, Kelly's body convulsed one last time, and then she lay still. Slowly, she opened her eyes. The terror that had gripped her seemed to dissipate, and she looked around at her parents and the priest. Her mother, tears streaming down her face, hugged her tightly. The priest whispered prayers of thanks, believing the spirit had finally been expelled. Kelly never doubted the power of the spirits again and made sure to respect the traditions of the ghost festival from that day forward. 
in the heart of an ancient forest, where the trees whisper secrets of centuries past, stands Blackwood Manor, a mansion shrouded in darkness and steeped in legend. Its imposing silhouette casts a long shadow over the land, a foreboding presence that beckons the unwary to its gates. The Thompson family, unaware of the horrors that await, approaches with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, drawn by the allure of a bargain they couldn't resist. That first night, as darkness descended upon Blackwood Manor, the house stirred from its slumber. Emily's ears caught faint whispers of drifting down from the attic, chilling her to the bone. Meanwhile, Mary stumbled upon old dolls arranged in eerie poses, their presence unsettling in the silence of the dimly lit room. John, ever the skeptic, brushed off their concerns, attributing it all to the house's age and neglect. But deep down, a primal fear gnawed at their resolve, a sense that they were not alone in the shadows. As days turned into nights, the manifestations within Blackwood Manor grew bolder. Phantom footsteps echoed relentlessly through the hollow halls, their, their source unseen, yet unmistakably present. Mary found herself inexplicably drawn to cold spots that seemed to materialize out of thin air, sending shivers down her spine. Emily, meanwhile, became fixated on the mirrors that lined her bedroom walls, where fleeting glimpses of dark, shifting shapes seemed to dance just beyond her reflection. Each encounter deepened their unease, a creeping dread that refused to be silenced. As the nights wore on, John's once steadfast demeanor began to crumble under the weight of unseen forces. His sleepless nights were spent fixated on a single flickering candle flame, his gaze unblinking and hollow. When sleep did come, it brought with it visions that left him trembling and disoriented, waking to find cryptic messages etched into the peeling wallpaper by hands that moved of their own volition. Emily, driven by a relentless curiosity, unearthed a hidden key concealed within the grasp of an antique doll, an artifact that would unlock the darkest secrets of Blackwood Manor. In the forgotten depths of Blackwood Manor, where the very air seemed to thicken with the weight of forgotten memories, huh? the family uncovered a relic of unspeakable darkness. Buried beneath layers of cobwebs and neglect lay an ancient, locked chest, an ominous vessel that held within its depths the remnants of a bygone era. With trembling hands, Emily unlocked its secrets, revealing cursed artifacts that seemed to pulsate with a malevolent energy. Among them, a weathered journal whispered tales of a sinister past, a tale of a cult that had once called Blackwood Manor home, its rituals steeped in blood and bound by a pact with forces beyond mortal comprehension. As the final night descended upon Blackwood Manor, a storm of unimaginable fury raged outside, lightning tearing through the sky like the wrathful strikes of a vengeful deity. Inside, the manor seemed to come alive, its very walls groaning under the weight of an ancient, malevolent force. Shadows writhed and contorted into grotesque shapes, their clawed fingers reaching out to ensnare the terrified family. The air was thick with dread, each breath a struggle against the suffocating presence that pervaded the house. Emily stood in the flickering candlelight, her face a mask of both fear and fierce determination. She could hear John, his voice a low, incoherent mumble as the spirit sought to claim him completely. The darkness pressed in from all sides, 
whispering twisted promises of doom and despair. With a cry of defiance, Emily hurled the cursed artifacts into the roaring fireplace. The flames exploded violently, casting an eerie, otherworldly glow that danced across the walls. Each item burned with a furious intensity, the shadows shrieking and writhing in agony as they were consumed by the purifying fire. The house shook with the force of a thousand tormented souls, the very foundation trembling as the dark presence fought to maintain its grip. But as the last cursed artifact was reduced to ash, a silence fell, a silence so profound it seemed to echo through the very soul. The oppressive weight lifted, the shadows retreated, and Blackwood Manor was left in an uneasy stillness, the air still heavy with the echoes of its dark past. With the dawn came the discovery of the Thompson family, unconscious but alive, rescued from the clutches of Blackwood Manor by a passing traveler. They departed swiftly, their eyes never looking back at the mansion that had become a crucible of nightmares. In its wake, Blackwood Manor stood silent and still, a sentinel of stone and shadow forever marked by the darkness that had once called it home. Years later, whispers of Blackwood Manor's haunted past continued to draw the curious and the brave. Another family, unaware of the tales that had woven themselves into the very fabric of its walls, ventured forth a testament to the enduring allure of darkness and the eternal cycle of fear. When Jason and I found the old mansion on the outskirts, we thought it was perfect for our getaway. It was rustic and cheap, surrounded by woods that added to its charm. We were greeted by Serene, the widow who owned the place. She mentioned she lived alone with her eight-year-old son, Eddie, on the second floor. Curiously, Eddie was nowhere to be seen during our check-in. There was something unsettling about the emptiness, but I brushed it off, attributing it to our excitement our room on the first floor was cozy despite the mansion's age. That first night, we settled into bed after a day of exploring. As I started to drift off, I was jolted awake by giggling and the sound of small feet running overhead. I nudged Jason, but he only mumbled and turned over, deeply asleep. I lay there for a while listening, but eventually convinced myself it was just Eddie playing. The next morning, I mentioned the noises to Serene. She smiled gently and assured me she would remind Eddie to be quiet at night. I felt a bit embarrassed for bringing it up, but hoped it would solve the problem. The second night, things took a darker turn. As I lay in bed reading, I heard the distinct sound of a ball bouncing on the floor above. Each thud was louder than the last, echoing in the silence. Curiosity got the better of me and I crept to the staircase. As I peered into the darkness, a ball suddenly rolled down the stairs, stopping at my feet. I hesitated, reaching for it, when a pair of pale, tiny hands snatched it away. I gasped, watching a small figure dart into the kitchen. My heart pounded as I followed, but when I reached the kitchen, it was empty. Eddie was nowhere to be found. Shivering, I returned to bed, my mind racing with possibilities. The third night was the worst. I had barely fallen asleep when I felt the bed shift. My eyes snapped open, and there, at the corner of the bed, sat Eddie, staring at me with an intense, unsettling gaze. My breath caught in my throat. Before I could react, he lunged at me. I screamed, jerking upright, but he was gone. Terrified and unable to sleep, I spent the rest of the night huddled in the corner of the room, my eyes darting to every shadow. Jason remained oblivious, lost in his dreams while I was trapped in a nightmare. Morning came, and with it, a resolve to confront Serene, but she was nowhere to be found. Frustrated and desperate for answers, I broke one of the house rules and ascended to the second floor. The air was colder, the shadows longer. As I explored, I stumbled upon a small, dusty room. My eyes fell upon a framed photo on the dresser. It was Eddie, but his eyes were lifeless his smile haunting. 
The inscription read, In loving memory of Eddie, 2002-2011. My blood ran cold. Eddie had been dead for years. I backed out of the room, my heart hammering in my chest. I ran down the stairs, grabbed Jason, and we hurriedly packed our things. Without a word, we left the keys on the table and fled the mansion. As we drove away, I glanced back at the old house. In one of the windows, I saw Eddie, his pale face, watching us go, a faint smile playing on his lips. Jason and I never spoke of our stay at the mansion again, but I can never forget those eyes watching me from beyond the grave. Thanks for diving into the shadows with us. If you enjoyed this story, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more spine-chilling tales. Stay curious, stay safe, and remember, sometimes the truth is scarier than fiction. Until next time, sleep tight if you can.